Hey, Austin. Hey, how's it going? How you doing? Nice to meet you finally. Oh, thank you. Nice meeting you too. Yeah, do you know, I think it must be about, uh, it must be 20 years, something like that, I think, since we first corresponded. I think it was way back. Oh. X-Plane 5. Oh, wow. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. And now we're on 12. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, do you know what? Thanks for um, thanks for talking to explain.org. I really appreciate it. I know that you're busy. Oh, no problem. Yeah. 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 Busy. That's for sure. Yeah. And we can talk about some of the things I'm busy with because it's all fun stuff. But uh, yeah, it, it busy. But of course, yeah, I want to want to follow up with explain.org, certainly to kind of let people know what I'm thinking about, you know, why I build a sim the way I do. Yeah. Yeah. So why explain, you know, what makes it so special? Right. So, um, so what makes X-Plane special to me, let me move the zoom thing. So I'm looking at my camera here. Yeah. So what, what makes X-Plane spe special to me is the app actually feels like it feels like to operate a real airplane. When I operate a real airplane, there's a tremendous amount that's going on. And it starts with the question of, well, what's the weather I'm going to be facing? What's the time of day? That matters so tremendously. What's the lighting going to be? Uh, the light matters tremendously because this is what's determined whether the sun is in your eyes. You land with the sun in your eyes, in, you know, at six o'clock in the evening, straight into a sunset, into a short runway with the sun coming at you. Literally, that is a major factor of landing an airplane. What about landing at night? That's a huge factor. Um, in a single engine airplane, especially night operations are a completely different ballgame because if the engine quits, I mean, you know what they say, right? If you're in a single engine airplane and the engine quits at night, the solution is to use the landing light, turn it on and see if you like what's in front of you. And if you don't turn the light off, that's yeah. it. Those are your options. And so, um, things like, uh, the time of day, the weather, oh, clouds. Oh my gosh. So back when I flew with Columbia 400, that airplane would really start to run out of breath above about 18 or 20,000 feet. It just couldn't climb any farther. Well, you fly in the Southeast in the summer, there may be cloud at 8,000 feet that go up to 30,000 feet. It's beyond the ability of the airplane to get over these clouds. Mm. And if you're only doing say 195 knots, as that airplane used to, to do, then clouds that cover 50 or 100 miles, you're you know talking 30, 45 minutes out of your way to try and get around them. And so when you're in a small plane, the clouds are so gigantic that trying to get up over them or under them or around them is a, is a major obstacle to getting where you're trying to go. And so when you are flying an airplane, especially a light airplane, the concept of what's the time of day, what's the weather, and then if you're deciding to tackle weather that is convective with clouds and thunderstorms all over the place, what's my strategy to get around it? And then once you're in this this natural weather system of, of clouds and weather and time and darkness and lighting and sun in your eyes and being so dark you can't see anything at all. Once you're in this environment, now you're starting to ask the question, okay, well, what can I pull off here with the airplane I've got? Mm -hmm. Now you're going down to questions, okay, what's my fuel on board? How far can I go with the fuel on board? Is there anything else in the airplane that's starting to go sideways? In my Cirrus, I'd have to ask the question, am I going to run out of de-icing fluid? In my Columbia, I'd have to ask the question, am I going to run out of uh, oxygen for my oxygen cannula if I'm above 12 thousand or so right. and so you've got all these things in the airplane that can be expended and so you're playing this game where time is marching on whether you like it or not the weather is changing whether you like it or not the clouds are big enough you're not going to get around them whether you like it or not and you're in an airplane that's gradually expending itself expending its own little resources to complete the flight and you need to make sure that no matter what happens you wind up touching down on a runway before your resources on board are expended Exactly. That's the non-negotiable outcome. And um, my goal with X-Plane these days is to build a sim that lets people experience this as they try and get from one point to another. And so the, the aircraft, the way the airplane flies, because remember, the overarching thing about all of this, while I'm talking about the weather, the, the conditions, the time of day, the expenditure of fuel and energy in the airplane, well, and also, of course, you're also doing this while you're interacting with air traffic control, right? Which also comes into this. Sometimes you have to talk to air traffic control, sometimes you don't. And if you are talking to air traffic control, whatever you do, you don't want them to be surprised about what you just did. That's when people exactly. start getting really annoyed and twitchy. And so you've also got an air traffic control that you're, you're, you're trying to interact with while you're managing this whole chess piece. It's sort of like playing chess while you're asking permission from someone to move the pieces. You know, it's just yet another <laughs> level you have to watch out for. And um, and then overarching on top of all of this is the fact that it's just assumed you know how to fly the damn airplane. 
right? Flying the airplane, that's just that's just the layer that sits. That's like the frosting on top of the cake. That's just, or maybe it's the plate. It's the plate that the cake sits on. And so what a lot of people do when they look in the simulator, they're like, oh, you know, I, I know how to fly an airplane. And while I'm flying this airplane, I'm looking at houses down below. Well, okay. Okay, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with saying, look, I know how to fly an airplane and look at houses. That's fine. But when you actually get to the point you want to operate an airplane to get from one point to another, the thing about how do I fly an airplane when I look at houses, that has nothing to do with the flight. What is the flight really about? What the flight is really about is knowing the conditions you're going to be flying in, knowing the weather you're going to be flying in, knowing the precipitation and cloudscape you're going to be flying in, being able to handle the airplane you're going to be flying in, and then continuously operating through all these systems while also integrating with the air traffic control system as the aircraft's resources are being consumed and having everything work out by the time you've touched down that none of these, these countless rules were violated. And when I say rules, I don't mean FAA rules. I mean more like rules of nature. You cannot land and you know you need to end the flight before you're out of gas. You need to end the flight before you're out of de-icing fluids. You need to end the flight before you're out of oxygen. You need to work through your flight without offending air traffic control. Offending meaning you know doing some sort of forbidden exactly. yeah. you know thing. And uh, you certainly need to end the flight without going through uh, airspace you're not allowed to go through. And I don't have that part simulated in the next plane now, but it's only a matter of time until I do. Um, and you need to be able to do this without question, uh, knowing how to operate your airplane. And if you really want to say that you're, that you're good, you need to be able to do it with random failures uh, in play, which x simulates very, very well. Um, to get this thing down in one piece, even if a number of failures have happened. So when you ask what I want to do with X-Plane, these days, that's what I want to do. Now, when I first started X-Plane, I was doing something completely different. When I first started X-Plane, when I very first started it, it was just so I could pass an instrument currency check. You know, can I do instrument flying where I scan all six instruments? You know, you got your standard six instruments, and I want to make sure I could pass an instrument check while I scan those six instruments. Well, I built the sim to do that because that's where I was in my aviation career at that point. I was just getting started. And the idea of passing an instrument currency check would be like the epitome of aviation. Back when you're just starting, you're just getting your instrument rating. Well, that's what it is to you. And then I quickly said, well, wait a minute. Now that I got this working for the Piper Archer 2, and I'm using blade element theory, I can apply this to all airplanes. And so then the mission became, okay, let's use X-Plane to predict how airplanes will fly. So X-Plane's gone through a number of evolutions. Mm. When I started, it was, can I pass an instrument currency check with an instrument scan and just fly an instrument approach according to the rules? Then it became, well, wait a minute, this is blade element theory. This could apply to any airplane. Can I predict how airplanes of the future will fly? Can I predict how an airplane will fly that you've envisioned in your mind and you think it'll fly well, but you don't know it. Plenty of people imagine their airplane's going to fly well, and people have died putting their stupid ideas into carbon fiber and killing themselves running into the ground because they didn't understand how the airplane would actually fly. There's there's yeah. fatalities in history from that type of, of nonsense. Um, and I call it nonsense because it's so easy to write a simulator, you know, or not to write a simulator, but to use. It's so easy to use a simulator um, where you put your design in a plane maker and you see how this airplane is going to actually fly. But um, today, I think the idea of just flying an instrument approach, that's assumed to you get in the sim. The idea of putting an aircraft into plane maker and then flying it in X plane. That's assumed to be a thing we can do. Those those are so well locked down uh, as features that I support that um, that's almost just this. We'll just assume at this point we're not going to break that. The level I want to go to now is perhaps not coincidentally associated with the level I operate real airplanes, which mm -hmm. is can you manage the entire flight safely, efficiently, and effectively in an ever changing game space, the game space being the weather, the air traffic control, the time, the airports you got to go to. Um, can you operate your airplane in an ever-changing game space to get safely and efficiently from one point to another and do so with an airplane that is consuming itself and having things fail en route? That's that's the challenge that, that I undergo every time I fly a real airplane. And um, that's what I want to bring into the simulator as well. Right. You know, um... Having used X Plane 12, what, you know, one of the biggest things, one of the most noticeable changes was the environment. You know, it just felt more alive, the weather, um, the volumetric clouds. Um, I was talking to somebody and, you know, we both kind of like agreed that 
X-Plane 12 managed to do a sense of scale and believability, which X-Plane 11 and all its previous, uh, you know, the previous versions couldn't, it, it didn't do so well, you know, but X-Plane 12, you actually feel as though the world is, is, is more alive, you know? Yep. And that's, that's something we're going to continue with. Um, I, we've, we've succeeded, I think, very well in showing the, how the world lives with the sun and the clouds and the rain and the ice and the wind and the turbulence. I think we've succeeded well. Oh, we succeeded well with how the water feels. Seaplane pilots do make up a fraction of the aviation community. And boy, have we bent over backwards to get the water and the seaplane dynamics right. Oh, my God. I work with a company called Bridger Aerospace, which flies like seaplanes. So it go skim along water to pick up water, and then they go dump it on forest fire. Yep. They fly uh, Canada Air, what, 215s and 415s, I think they're called. And so, I mean, I have sent them no less than 50, 50 private X-plane executables to get the seaplane model up to the point that they were finally just like, I don't see how it gets any better than this. You've got it in the sim. We're ready to train our pilots. So, so that was an, a nice little fun add-on. And of course, we're pretty serious about the airport environment as well. So what's kind of interesting is what, what is the environment that we want to simulate? And obviously people say, oh, I want more scenery and ortho photos. Okay, okay. We're also working on that. Yes, that is true. We're always working on upgrading the scenery. But when I fly an airplane, it's not to look down at somebody's house. It's to do that thing I just said, safely get from one point to another in a dynamic environment. And so you point out the dynamic environment you see in X-Plane 12. Well, that's no coincidence. We've got the dynamic dynamic environment of the clouds, the weather, the rain, the wind, but there's a little more environment than that. The ground environment can matter, but where it matters is at the airport and on the water, because that's where you're starting and stopping your flights, on the water for seaplanes, on the airport, obviously for land planes. And that's why our airports are quite a bit more than passable, and our water is just absolutely just incredible. And if you haven't done any seaplane operations next plane 12 yet, you should definitely try it. It's awesome. And if you come away saying, oh, that was hard. Oh, yeah, it is just right. It is just right. So, so how far, you know, when you talk about the water, how far is that modeled? Is it just on the layer? Is it, is it below the water? You know, kind of like how, how deep does that simulation go for the water? So it's fascinating. What we finally did, and I wish we could have done this 20 years ago. I've been asking it for it from my artists for probably at least a decade. But what we finally have is when the artist, they design these wave patterns for the water based on math that is is used to generate real waves okay the, there's math that can describe what the wave shapes of water is at various different ways they took that math and they designed the water into this three-dimensional matrix well yeah it is a three-dimensional think of it as a sheet a bed sheet that's put over a lumpy mattress okay right. a bed sheet is put over a lumpy mattress that's what our water is it's a three-dimensional shape but it's only three dimensions in that it's a sheet sitting you know that describes a certain shape all right, now, once they have that rendered, they also pass it to my flight model. So when my flight model says, I've got a little bit of a float right here, float of an airplane, you know, airplane float or, or a hull, mm -hmm. it will interact it with the water elevation as it exists at that moment in space and time. And the next plane breaks the floats or the bodies or the fuselages, the hulls, or whatever you want to call it in the airplane, down to many little pieces, just like it does with wings. It's just like with blade element theory. And, and applies those little bits of geometry to see how much they are pushing down into the water or the sheet, you know, at that point. Yeah. And what's kind of cool is with, with floats planes, it is not just how much the float goes under this sheet, you know, where the buoyancy pushes you back. Oh no, that ain't nothing. Once you're moving that force that you think of boats, you know, using, mm. which is, oh, well, it sinks down under the water and the water is heavy. So, you know, the buoyancy yeah. pushes it back. That force is negligible once you get 50 knots on. All right, you get 50 knots on, flotation doesn't even matter anymore. At 50 knots, it's all about inertia. It becomes a complete inertia game where the inertia is the inertia of the water. You cannot kick that water out of the way fast enough. And so what seaplanes do is once they start building up speed, the inertia of the water hitting the float causes the float to pop up on top of the water and ride it like a water ski. And this is called running on the step. And so um, the dynamics we've got, yes, we probe a, 
each little point or element of the aircraft, see how far it's going down below this sheet of water for buoyancy. Mm. But that buoyancy is only, it only even matters. And we, we use it all the time. We apply this flight model all the time, but you only notice it below 10, 20, 30 knots or something like that. Um, because the next thing we consider is not just where the water is, but how fast the point of the airplane is moving, right? How fast a little bit of the float is moving mm. because that's controlling, oh, and how fast the wave is moving up and down, but much more importantly than that, how fast this point is moving up a wave, right? Because if a wave is shaped like this and your probe point or your bit of your float is right here, you might say, oh, okay, there's a little bit of force because you're displaced a little underwater. Uh-uh, uh-uh, no way. Because if you're going 50 knots this way, Yep. You are running into a mountain of water. And so the dynamic, the dynamic part of the fact that you're running into a climbing hill, you see, that you're that you're getting more water per millisecond, mm. that's by far a greater force than flotation. And so to answer your question, how do we model the water? It's a three-dimensional sheet. We mm. take the float, you know, for each little bit of the airplane, we put it under that sheet to get the flotation effect. But much, much, much more important than that is we look at how fast our probe points are moving and moving compared to the water and especially the, the, the ever-changing shape of the water with those mm. waves. And the dynamic effect is much stronger than the flotation effect. And the reason is water is heavy. It can't get out of your way quickly. It's too heavy to get out of your way quickly. Sure. So you start building up speed, your only option is to ride on top of it. So how much, of you know, kind of, you know, um, there's always a lot of talk about, you know, how much uh cpu uh gpu resources you know x-plane uses with all these calculations for water for the weather you know what is the ratio kind of right nowadays of you know kind of how much of the gpu does x-plane use for actual calculations aside away from the graphic side right and the answer is the gpu is much busier than the cpu in x-plane 12 and in x-plane 11 was reversed x-plane 11 was mostly cpu and people's graphics cards would just sit around wasting time mm. for x-plane 12 we've upped the graphics tremendously we put a lot of the clouds and the water and the lighting boom we've loaded over to the gpu and so now that gpu is up at red line and the cpu is sitting there twiddling its fingers wondering what it wants to do next yep. and so in a perfect world every time we ran x-plane your computer would melt down after one flight right because every single thing would be running wide open throttle yep. um but we're never nobody's ever going to have it balanced that perfectly because some stuff is programmed to run in the cpu and some is run to run on the gpu some people have fast gpus and slow cpus some people have fast cpus and slow gpus Everything in a hundred percent all at once, even though that's obviously what we want. Mm. Hell, we also want the government to spend money efficiently, right? I mean, you don't always get what you want. <laughs> the question is, how close can you get? Is that and um, we are loading a lot more stuff onto the GPU, and uh, I'm quite certain that's a good thing because it means those graphics cards are getting used, and that's why. Uh, so many people, not everyone, but so many people, I think most people are seeing great frame rates in X-Plane 12, and in many cases better than they saw with 11, because they've got good GPUs, and that's just grabbing all these calculations um, for clouds and water and lighting. The flight model is still in the CPU, but what's interesting is going from X-Plane 11 to X-Plane 12, mm. the graphics might take, I don't know, five times as much work to do, maybe. But because they're all loaded on the GPU, we're not running at one fifth the frame rate, are we? We're running at very similar, in some case, better frame rates mm. because it, we are doing five times more work. Or I, I say five, it might not be exactly five. We're doing more work. Okay. I'm sure someone will sit there and compare. Like, oh, no, it's actually 4.3 times more work. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. But we're doing a lot more work. But because we're loading it onto the GPU, more work is getting done in the same amount of time. And that's why the frame rate isn't tanking. Uh, and I can tell you the flight model, though, where well, the graphics are way more powerful in X-12 than X-11, the flight model, I might use 20% more, 25% more, because my flight model work has been almost entirely just making the math better and smarter and dialing in all of these different effects. But you don't actually have to require a lot more CPU calculations to get that done. You just have, I, I'm able to make the flight model smarter, not bigger. And so when we go to X-Plane 12, yeah, there is more flight model because we've got wing downwash, wake, prop wash, and all these things interact with each other. And it's always slow in a computer to have things interact with each other because each thing has to check all the other things. 
And so when it's one of like those polynomial type problems, well, if there's twice as many things to check, it's eight times as much work, right? Because each thing has to check against every other thing. It's yeah. that problem. And so, yeah, we, I do that better in X-Plane 12. We've got, because now we've got the wings casting wake, which we didn't have before, and the downwash, and the prop wash, and each you know, thing affects each other part. And so, yeah, that has run up the flight model a bit. But the overall flight model might only be 25 or 50% more uh, CPU intensive. So the flight model is only going up a little bit in requirements because it's already pretty damn good for x mm. 11. And I've just made it smarter, not bigger for version 12. But the graphics, the graphics load has gone up through the roof thanks to all these clouds and lighting and water. But we loaded it on the GPU to not get sucker punched in the frame rate. Okay. You know, you'd, um, a little while ago, you mentioned kind of, you know, um, uh, also, um, also scenery, kind of like photographic scenery and what, like you know, um, mm. what is there to you know for you know for VFR flyers, you know, um, who who have come from X Plane Eleven to X Plane Twelve, you know, uh, what changes can they can they see perhaps in the future with with X Plane Twelve? Unknown. Okay, so I don't. First of all, let me say I don't know. Now, to back up and address the scenery issue, it looks like the world right now is kind of in two camps on X Plane Twelve. By the way, I have not spent much time at all reading reviews. I'm simply putting my time into work. But I've heard through the grapevine, it's like some fraction. I'll call it half. Might not be half. Half the people are like, "Oh yes, all the lighting and weather and clouds and you know flight model. This is great." And half are like, "Wait a minute, the scenery is not nearly as good as Microsoft. What good is X Plane?" Well, I mean, to me, this takes us right back to where we open the interview. What do we do when we operate an airplane? When I operate an airplane, it's not to say, oh, look at Joe's house. I can see Joe's house. I mean, that's just not what I use an airplane for. Yeah. And if it's not what I use an airplane for, why would I use a sim for it? And so, yeah, the scenery is simply, if you want scenery, let me tell you what scenery matters. The scenery at the airport, the scenery on the water, the scenery where you're interacting with the ground. Remember, x men is a flying simulator, not a driving simulator. And there are certain times you drive an airplane. That's when you're on a runway. That's when you're on the water. That's when it's a driving simulator, when you're on the water or the airport environment. And so that's why our water is, is I, I'm quite certain, the best in the world for any flight sim ever done, ever. And our airports are not too shabby. So um, I'm concentrating on the scenery where it matters. And where does it matter? Well, it matters when you're driving the airplane, not when you're flying the airplane. Now, that said, yeah, we still want to have better scenery, and we're going to have it. And I've actually already got Ben looking and what some next generation technologies would be. But no, I'm not going to talk about specific version numbers for specific scenery paradigms and whatnot, because we just haven't decided yet. We don't know. Right now, what I'm doing is building the sim that simulates the airplane in the way we actually, we, we meaning pilots, actually mm -hmm. operate airplanes. You know, and well, sorry. we're succeeding in that area. One, one thing I did notice, you know, which, you know, maybe it was kind of my imagination, but the um, the topography, you know, kind of like, you know, I live up in Scotland. So the first thing I do is, you know, I want to fly around my area. And I noticed, you know, that, you know, the mountains and whatnot were a lot, were, were um, uh, sharper, a lot clearer than, than X-Plane 11, you know. So I don't know if there are any changes there, but, you know, the way... There are. I mean, we remember we can always bump up the the uh, the terrain detail, the mesh density of our terrain topography. And so, yeah, I mean, we do have some new global scenery for X Plane Twelve. I mean, we're smarter about our mesh uh, density. I, I forced my guys to be smarter about the way they draw the roads. Um, we've got new auto gen art assets. So yeah, we have improved those things, and it doesn't surprise me that you see better terrain mesh density and therefore sharper and more precisely defined mountains, and especially the trees. I I know we did go overboard with the trees. Holy cow, are these trees awesome? This could be a freaking tree simulator for the trees we've done. Uh, not strictly necessary for a flight sim, but it does look pretty dang good. And when you come down to the little grass strips in the middle of the mountains and stuff like that, I admit having nice detailed trees around the grass strips that does actually count as the airport or its environment. So um, the, the trees are pretty awesome. And maybe that's helped make the scenery a little better too. The fact that you really got 3D trees on the mountains, not mm. just ugly, blurry, you know, satellite photos. Okay. So um, there has been some, some uh, improvement in the scenery. It doesn't surprise me. It looks sharper and more precise as we go to higher mesh density. And the 3D trees really make the mountains start to look like honest to goodness mountains. So yeah, we've got some improvements there. And of course, we're going to keep on, we're going to keep on improving it as we always have. If future's not going to change right we're going to keep you know keep going in this direction sure how did you go about doing the um uh, one of the most enjoyable features are the ambient the new ambient sounds 
Mm. Oh yeah. So that was Daniela Rodriguez down in uh, Argentina and she's our new sound engineer. And when, um, we, every, every week, everybody at Laminar Research reports to me, you know, what they're doing. We'll report to each other what we're doing. And I noticed Daniela saying that she was doing ambient sounds. Like, what the hell are ambient sounds? I don't care about ambient sounds. When you're in an airplane, this is what you hear. All right, that's what you hear in an airplane. Uh, what the hell do we need ambient sounds for? But then sure enough, when you go to those external views or when you shut down an airplane by a river, by a train track, by mm -hmm. a, a big city on a runway, holy cow, it actually, it starts to feel like you're there. It doesn't quite feel like you're there. And here's why. Here's why. Whenever you make a simulation of anything, the entire simulation is only as good as its weakest link at any given moment. In other words, right now in X, so, so at first, let's say, let's say X plane 11. No, no, let's go back to X plane 10. In X plane 10, you would say, ooh, there's, it, everything's texture mapped. Do you remember when texture map mm -hmm. was like you? It was like, oh my God, texture maps, yeah. right? And so maybe back even, this is probably back a little bit before X plane 10, maybe as early as version eight, you say, oh, it's texture mapped. It feels real. But God, were those textures flat. It was so obviously an ortho photo, which I just think look, looks like garbage, just an image painted. Or it's like painting the scenery on a piece of cardboard. It's like, there's your scenery. No, I don't think so. Not for me. Uh uh. But yeah. um, so you'd have texture maps. That was your first level of realism. But you still didn't really feel like you were there because you were looking at a painting that somebody had taken off your wall and put on the ground and told you it was real. Then you start to get into saying, oh, now we have 3D buildings. Well, okay, you have 3D buildings, but you see they didn't interact with the ground properly. They didn't have the right shadows. They didn't have the right you know, edges. You, you, you see like a, a physical building on top of a painting of a building, but the painting of the building on the, on the ortho photo would leak out you know, to either side of the building. You'd see the roof like, and it's like, what the hell is this? And then we'd say, okay, now we're going to get incredible lighting and bump mapping as we're starting to get an X plane 12. We're still not good enough, by the way, with the runway lighting, in my opinion. But um, then you start to get the good lighting. You're like, oh, yeah, okay, that's real. But you don't quite have the bump maps to me to make the runway feel three dimensional. The runway doesn't feel quite as 3D as a real runway does yet. It's still too flat and perfect. Um, and then you hear the sounds. And the sounds, they are basically perfect. The sounds are like, the ambient sounds are exactly like being outside. Mm. And while I hear these ambient sounds, half of my brain wants to say, this is reality. But the other half of my brain is saying, wait, this runway is way too flat. This isn't a real world, this is a simulation. And these clouds, they look kind of low res. I can see they're kind of pixelated. This isn't the real world, this is a simulation. Mm. And so we're only as strong as our weakest link. And we've just brought the sounds up to the highest possible level we brought our lighting up. As far as I'm concerned, the lighting is basically the highest possible level. I can't tell any of the lighting and sim reality. But our clouds are still looking a little pixelated. Our scenery is still kind of left over from X Plane 11. Our runways are still kind of flat. And we're going to solve that runway problem, I guarantee you. But the runways are still looking kind of flat and fake. And so the, the ambient sounds that you point out are absolutely awesome and they're incredible but it it doesn't quite draw me into the sim because we've got other weak points we've got to address first sure you know you mentioned uh the runways and um you know uh and whatnot in 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 previous renditions in previous versions of x-plane uh there was always the um runways follow the contours you know on off you know uh with, with x-plane 12 we haven't got that so how is x-plane 12 um you know how is it working out the, you know, what, how a runway should be, you know, with the topography of the land, you know? Right. So here's, we took that runway option, you know, follow terrain contours or not away because it kept causing bugs. Anytime you can have the scenery render in two different ways, you're like quadrupling the number of bugs you can have, not doubling it, quadrupling because each thing could interact with something else. You see, for example, people like, they would have runways follow terrain on their master machine, but not on their external visual. And then they'd be like, well, why is it out of sync? Or people would have ortho photos and then how the ortho photos behave uh. would be different depending on the checkbox. And then the bug reports would come into us, but nobody would ever mention what their rendering option was set as and they say something is broken. And so I finally was like, look, I'm not gonna have this problem space doubled, which causes the bug reports to go up by a factor of four or eight. We are gonna decide on the terrain 
And that is what we are going to go with. And that's why that checkbox went away. So what do the runways do? This is always follow runway terrain contours on. There is no button. It always does the answer as yes. Runways do follow terrain contours. And the reason is, in reality, runways follow terrain contours. So I took the option away so to minimize the number of bug reports and things that can go wrong, so the runways always follow the contours. Now, what happens next? People kind of be saying, wait a minute, runways are always following the terrain contours. Your sim has a dip in the middle of the runway we don't have in reality. Well, the bug there is not that I need to have flat runways. No, the bug is we need better terrain data. And so, uh, and we'll get it, we'll get it because there's algorithms that can smooth out terrain data based on where runways are. And I've written these types of algorithms before. Um, there's better terrain topography maps that we can get. And so the next step is to solve the real issue, which is the terrain elevation needs to be perfect and higher resolution. And you're starting to see this higher resolution mm -hmm. terrain. You're seeing it right now in the mountains of Scotland. So you're seeing, you're seeing this higher mesh uh, you know, density. And um, the next is to make sure we also get that mesh right for all the airports. Because runways are following terrain in reality, so they're doing it in the sim. Let's get that terrain dialed in. That's the underlying problem. And that's something we're always going to be improving over time. Okay, brilliant. You know, um, Austin, I could talk to you all day, uh, but I just wanted to thank you for for taking your time to talk to us. And uh, sure. I really appreciate it. And that's it. all you want to go over? Because that was very, very short. Is, is 30 minutes all you want? Because I that... allocated an hour. If oh, did you really? Like, oh, okay. Then, oh, I'm kind I of... allocated an hour. And there's so much more to explain, as you know. So I can give you another 30 minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, well, you know, um, but let's talk about um, the tools for X-Plane then. Let's, um, you know, uh, you know, we've got uh, Plane Maker. Um, so mm -hmm. um, what enhancements do we see in uh, Plane Maker? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, it's so funny. Yeah. So I wrote Plane Maker like 30 years ago, right? I wrote it 30 years ago, back when monitors all ran at 800 by 600, right? The monitor was 800 by 600. So the UI was 800 by 600. And all the font sizes were perfect for 800 by 600. Then I go to some people's office and these, I'm not going to name names, but these are the types of people that have Bitcoin mining operations in their office. They have monitors the size of the freaking you know, large screen TVs they used to just like show replays at the Super Bowl or something like, and this monitor's 4K, you know, so it's like 4,000 pixels by 2,000 pixels, even though that's like way more than they're, they ever need, way more than the human eye could ever show. It's, it's basically pointless. But, um, and then they open up Plane Maker and what is it? It's like some tiny little postage stamp and like the upper <laughs> left hand corner of their monitor. And you're up like this trying to read, you know, the, the um, read, you know, these, these tiny little fonts. And so um, what I've done is uh, made the UI a, a good bit bigger. So I, I popped it up to like, oh, I don't know, 1280 by 1024, whatever it is, and much larger fonts. And so Plane Maker, it's just, it's just larger now to, so that it's legible on these big high-res monitors. And I also made it quite a bit nicer in that you can kind of drag windows around anywhere you want. And so you can do something with these nice big monitors. You can have the airplane visible, you know, anywhere you want on the screen and then drag the window off to the side you see, and you can sit there and go boop, 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 tweaking all the little stats for the airplane on the window while you see the airplane changing in real time in the background. And that's something that's enabled by these big monitors. In other words, if people are going to use these big high-res monitors, let's let's play to our advantage and give a UI that supports that. And so the, uh, the, the bigger fonts, the movable windows, the fact you can see the airplane in the background while you do the adjustment on your window, these all just take the fact that some of us have big monitors and lets us freaking use them. Sure. Okay. Um, one of the questions which, uh, uh, which came to me was about uh, military uh, mm -hmm. weapons and, and what, mm -hmm. any changes on that front? No, no, no. So, I mean, I'm not exactly a pacifist. I'm really not. But the weapon systems, you know, I, I admit I have certain priorities. And as you've seen, my priority is the flying environment not the ground environment. I'm building a flying simulator, not a yeah. driving simulator. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and my priority right now is enhancing safety 
for pilots enhancing safety and enhancing this feeling we opened this interview with, which is how to safely operate an airplane. That's just been my focus rather than trying to shoot somebody else down. I mean, there are pretty good combat sims. Everybody's done, what's that combat sim everybody loves so much where um, it's got super realistic physics and you're mostly doing World War II airplanes. Yeah. It's like it's metal it's something or other like that. It's Battle of, it, Battle of Stalingrad. Was it that one? No, no. There's this, there's this other one. All right. Well, uh, some, somebody will put it in the comments, but it's this really awesome, like World War II, Sam, where you go around and you, they have new propeller, you know, visuals that look super good. Yeah. But, um, I mean, it, from the visuals I've seen, I haven't actually flown the sim, but from the visuals, I mean, you got these guys chasing each other around. I mean, it looks awesome. I mean, there, there are already combat sims out there that yeah. are pretty good. And, you know, when there's already good combat sims out there, I, I'm not going to distract my team from the thing that, that really matters and the type of aviation I want to present to go uh, upgrade the weapons. I mean, the other day, literally just the other day, day before yesterday, I was out at an Air Force base here in this country meeting with their, their fleet commanders for aerial refuelers to get x to simulate aerial refuelers. Well, it's a military application, but it doesn't involve weapons. And this, this sim here, if, if they use x to train their refueler pilots, it will improve the safety of the military refueling fleet. It will reduce the cost of training when they can do training in a very affordable sim rather than a much more expensive sim. And if they can build up proficiency in the simulator, so that they have to take less flights in the actual airplane, it will save hundreds of thousands of gallons of gas annually without question. Um, and so when I look at deployment of the SIM, military deployment of the SIM is fine, but I'm gonna do it where I know I'm saving taxpayer dollars, saving gas, improving safety. That for me is an absolute home run. I'm not going to pull my focus away from that to get into weapon systems when there's already good weapon systems out there. And yeah. I'm perfectly happy with my contribution being to improve aviation safety. Okay, sure. Okay. Well, Austin, uh, do you know what? I'm uh, my my Zoom is limited to 40 minutes, you know, because I'm such oh. a I'm such a cheapo. Oh, uh, oh well, yeah, yours is gonna go in three minutes then. All yes. right. So um I just do you know what I just wanted to say, you know, kind of like, you know, uh thanks. I really appreciate it. It was uh, you know, for yep. me for me personally, kind of like having X Plane, um, you know, my wife uh got it as a pre you know, for, for me as a present 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um it's it's a great sim. Uh love it and uh all the best with X-Plane 12. All right, sounds good. Yep, we're going to keep on going in the direction we're going. If you want to know what the future is, look at the past, extrapolate. Cheers. Thanks ever so much, Austin. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.